America's second oldest motorsports has not really changed with the times. Rather, for the last 140 years, it has been one of the most death-defying, riveting, demanding spectacles in the history of motor racing. And it's all done a mountain called Pikes Peak. Pikes Peak is not the tallest mountain in Colorado. It is located in the front range of the Rocky Mountains at a height of 14,115 feet above sea level, but it's not the tallest. But that's not what makes it interesting. What's interesting is it has the highest highway in America. You see, way back at the turn of the 20th century, Spencer Penrose, an American entrepreneur businessman guy, super rich, wanted to build a road up Pikes Peak. Because the original road, well, wasn't really a road. It was a carriage trail. Now, granted, a car did drive up the carriage trail when William Wayne Brown drove his Bearcat up the summit, although it took him over five hours, but, you know, it did it. Penrose wanted everyone to be able to see the majesty of Colorado scenery from 14,000 feet up. So, he built the Pikes Peak Highway in 1915 for 500 grand. I say highway. It was dirt, but it was a road that you could drive up without taking five hours. This road technically doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't go to a city, it doesn't go to a place, it just goes to the top of a peak. And he wanted to make sure that people knew about this place, and he knew there was this gorgeous opportunity, so... He did what Americans do best. He hosted a motorsport race. So the first Pikes Peak hill climb was held between August 10th and August 12th, 1916. And, oh boy, it was quite a tricky one. The course was 12.4 miles long, it had 156 corners, and the lowest altitude it reached was 9,000 plus feet. And then it climbed an extra 5,000 feet on top of that to the summit. Oh, and there was no guardrails of any kind on the dirt road. And it wasn't just that. The weather changed too. And there were animals all over the place. Mountain goats were a big problem. Despite this, people flocked to Pikes Peak hill climbing. And the winner of the first one was Rhea Lentz at a time of 20 minutes, 55 seconds, which is actually really good for a 1916 car. And then the race was immediately canceled because of this little World War I inconvenience. However, racing was resumed in 1920 and the times began to tumble because of a certain decade-long rivalry between drivers Glenn Schultz and Lewis Unser, who would go on to win 12 Pikes Peaks between them. It wasn't just the spirit of competition that was shattering the records, it was the cars. You see, motor racing still was getting bigger, but it wasn't as it is today. So manufacturers didn't really compete in it, so what people did is they took their normal road cars, massively modified them, stripped them out, rebuilt them basically, and they were called special variants, Studebaker specials, Chevy specials, whatever. These things had a lot more power, a lot less weight, and they could actually somewhat handle. And they shattered all records and won every event except for 1935, when it was won by a Chevy pickup truck weighing over a ton. I don't know what happened in 1935. <laughs> but apart from that odd exception, times were tumbling. By 1940, they were falling to under 16 minutes, just in time for the race to be cancelled again because of a certain World War II inconvenience. But when World War II ended, everything started to get kicked up into high gear. Lewis Unser came back 
driving his Maserati to victory in 46 and 47. And that name might be pretty recognizable to anyone who knows Pikes Peak because the Unser family has won 26 out of the 97 Pikes Peaks ever ran. That is domination that the Hamiltons cannot claim. Christ. The 1960s rolled in and saw significant changes on the horizon. For instance, the famous Offenheiser Indy engine, which also competed at Pikes Peak, scored its last outright Pikes Peak victory in 1964, setting a new record of 12 minutes and 24 seconds. And as the 1970s rolled around, that whole manufacturers not taking part thing started to change. As Porsche and Volkswagen claimed victories with, well, basically go-karts, let's be honest. It wasn't just manufacturers that were starting to take part. Alternative fuel sources started to arrive in the 70s with a Sears electric car finishing in 32 minutes, but at least it finished. More impressively though, the 1971 event was won outright by a propane-powered Mustang which was not only the first alternative fuels class car to win, it was the first road car to win. Everything else has specials, custom made monsters. This was a road car that was modified for propane use, and it claimed an outright victory. And as we move in the 1980s, these factory efforts like Porsche and Volkswagen started to get serious. Michel Mouton claimed the first of three outright victories for the ridiculous Audi Sport Quattro when she won in 1985. And two years later, Walter Roll broke the 11 minute barrier with a stupid 800 horsepower Quattro S1E2 with the most comical aerodynamics. You thought the normal Quattro was crazy in the aerodynamic department? It ain't got nothing on the Pikes Peak one. Although that victory was short-lived because Peugeot and Ari Vatanen struck back with their 405 T16 with even more comical bodywork. It's just getting crazier here, fellas. By setting a new record by just 0.6 seconds. But hey, it was faster. So in your face, Audi. Although, well, it's Peugeot and Audi with their Group B rally cars would be silenced by the Japanese invasion of the 1990s. The Toyota Celica showed up, setting a record that would stand for 13 years when it raced in 1991. That is obscenely long to have a record at Pikes Peak. It is the longest time ever held by a Pikes Peak record holder that thing was quick. Surprisingly though, it was actually quicker than the silhouette racers, which were becoming more and more common, as well as the silly aerodynamics. The aerodynamics on these are comical. But that did have a peculiar outcome. Because the silhouette racers were crazy, it was becoming more and more popular, anything had a chance to win, and anything did win. Toyota Tacoma pickup trucks? Yep, that's good. GMC Envoy SUVs? Sure thing, that's a, that can get a W. And even Suzuki XL7s were coming within a minute and a half of breaking the 10 minute barrier. Now granted, when Nobishiro Tajima drove his space frame fiberglass 1000 horsepower all wheel drive Suzuki, it wasn't exactly stock as you can tell. These are now basically Formula One cars with closed wheels pretty much. They're insane. It wasn't just the crazy vehicles that were making the times tumble though. You see, an environmental lawsuit was filed against the guys who run Pikes Peak Highway. Not the hill climb, the, high, the hill climb just runs the highway, they don't actually own it. The guys who own it were sued for environmental concerns of gravel and dirt runoff after rebuilding the road every year because the road gets washed away because it's dirt and the runoff gets into the rivers and that causes environmental problems so they sued and well the highway lost 
so they had to start paving the road. This meant that from 2002 to 2011, the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb was a mixed surface event, which added even more complexity to the already very demanding course, because they had to build a car that could handle 75% tarmac while also not dying on the 25% dirt. And in fact, it would be 2011 with the last dirt hill climb as 2012, well, welcomed us to the 21st century, if I'm honest. And people thought that that would be the end of Pikes Peak. The purists raised their pitchforks and torches and said, we want dirt. This Pikes Peak is over now. We can't have our dirt race and we're done. Um, 2012 saw the most competitors enter in the history of the event at over 140, so they were wrong. But this opened up a whole new can of worms, this pavement. The speeds were regulated on dirt. You can only go so fast on the corners on the dirt. On the tarmac, the speeds increased exponentially. And it's not like the pavement was any less bumpy. Because the freeze-thaw cycle works on a daily basis at the summit of Pikes Peak, the road surface can change between practice sessions. The surface gets incredibly bumpy and cracks and all sorts of imperfections happen on this road. It's a real challenge. It is not silky smooth. It is very bumpy. It is probably one of the bumpiest tarmac roads you can get. This means that every time you go up the course, it is slightly different and slightly more challenging than the last time. So, drivers have to be extremely careful and extremely perfect in order to get a good run. And that is exactly what happened in 2013. Because in 2013, Pikes Peak saw the timetable change like never before. The Suzuki XL7 guy, Tajima, drove his e-runner to the first sub-10 minute time ever for an electric car, and he was just one of four drivers that year to break the overall record. But let's be honest here, if we're talking about Pikes Peak in 2013 and record holders, there's only one car that matters, the Peugeot 208 T16. Peugeot decided to take the top spot once and for all in Pikes Peak and designed a custom built from the ground up car, loosely based ish, on the 208 hatchback. Although that was all of the similarities that it had. The chassis was carbon fiber, the twin turbocharged 3.2 liter V6 was mounted in the middle, and it made 875 horsepower. The car was fit with all-wheel drive, and thanks to the carbon fiber and space frame chassis and fiberglass body panels, it weighed just 875 kilograms. The aerodynamics were borrowed from the 2009 Le Mans champion, the 908 LMP1 car. The all-wheel drive system that I mentioned earlier, combined with the powered weight ratio of 1 to 1 in your face cone exeg, meant a 0 to 60 of 1.8 seconds, and even more impressively, it hit his 150 mile an hour top speed in 7 seconds flat. It shattered the overall record by over a minute at 8 minutes 13 seconds to go 12.4 miles. It held that record for 5 years until 2018 when Volkswagen struck back, no pun intended, the all-electric 700 horsepower Volkswagen IDR was not built for any racing series, it was not built for touring cars or Formula 1 or hill climbing, it was designed to go as fast as possible on every circuit you can imagine, and it started out with Pikes Peak, and it succeeded. It became the first car in history to break the 8-minute barrier was a stupid time of 7 minutes, 57 seconds, and 15 milliseconds. That is an incredibly fast car, and it makes sense. The electric car has no power delay, because obviously, as you get higher in altitude, 
the last power you can produce. It's simple mechanics. The Volkswagen doesn't need it because it's electric. Also, 700 horsepower, more torque. Obviously, it's going to deploy all of it instantly with all-wheel drive, so not really all that surprising. Although, based on the interviews I've heard with Peugeot's team boss, I don't think they're going to let that record rest on his laurels, and they'll be back someday. I've mentioned all these fantastic cars, the history of the runs, but what about now? How does it run now? Well, there are currently several classes of vehicle that you can run in that allow pretty much any car on Earth to compete. Notice how I said car, because sadly the motorcycle class was brought to an end last year when four-time Pikes Peak champion Carlin Dune crashed and died just a few corners from finishing in 2019. If you do still like that thrill, there is a quads class, and a Porsche one make racing series class. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There is a vintage car class, where each car must have been produced before 1995 and competed in a past event. Then there's the Time Attacks 1 and 2, for four-wheel drive and two-wheel drive production cars, provided they have a closed cockpit, a valid VIN number, and a production run of at least 500 units. Then we have the Open class for production cars, which is basically the, the same thing, only you can modify your car however you want. You have unlimited modification capacity. Then we have the Open Wheeled class which is designed for single-seater vehicles that, that ranging from sprint cars to dune buggies to pretty much anything provided it meets open wheels, single seat. Then, if your car doesn't meet any of those requirements, there's the exhibition class that allows any vehicle to compete provided it meets basic rules and safety regulations. Now, naturally, there's no record. You can't set a record in the exhibition class given the nature of it since it's a misfits class and it's designed to demonstrate advancements in motorsport technology. So it's not really a record class, although an exhibition class vehicle can compete for overall honors. Although it's highly unlikely that an exhibition class vehicle would win top honors because there is also the Unlimited class. Unlimited may very well be the last true anything goes motorsport left on this earth. Provided your vehicle meets basic track standards and safety regulations, you are good to go. This list of absolute purpose-built monsters includes the Suzuki SX-5, the Peugeot 208 T16, the Volkswagen IDR, just to name a few. These cars routinely run 700 plus horsepower, usually in the 1000 horsepower range, let's be real here. They have comically large body kits, and thanks to their lightweight construction using the top-of-the-line space-age materials, these vehicles routinely weigh 2,000 pounds or less, despite having all-wheel drive. They're so fast that over the last 15 competitions, the Unlimited class has won 12 of them. It's, they're freaking nuts. I love them. They're some of the fastest closed-wheel vehicles on Earth right now claiming records everywhere from Goodwood to Nürburgring. They are unstoppable, purpose-built monsters. And we're just gonna have to wait to see which unlimited class vehicle can dethrone the mighty Volkswagen.